Thank you very much. Uh, welcome everybody to the Galway City Museum uh, for this evening's special event, Gilgamesh in Conversation. We are very fortunate to have with us uh, the creative force behind a remarkable film, The Legend of Gilgamesh, that's the playwright Marina Carr and the director, Noreen Kavanagh. Uh, we're also here together with Michael Clark, who is an expert in the Gilgamesh story. And the story itself has its origins about 4,000 years ago. So we're going back in time really to one of the earliest surviving uh, narratives, in effect, epics or legends, uh, which we're going to try to think about tonight a, a, as a creative resource. So before I introduce the panelists a little bit more, I'll just say something about the Gilgamesh story. It, it, it originates in Mesopotamia. Um, in the ancient Near East. Um, it recounts the exploits of Gilgamesh, uh, king of Uruk, which were first recorded in the Sumerian language and then brought together around 1800 BC in a single epic account. It has come down to us in various different fragments, um, including an important presentation in a, tw a 12 tablet format or structure that dates somewhere from about 1400 BC. Now, the story itself revolves around the misdeeds and oppressions of Gilgamesh uh, in Uruk, uh, the creation of, of a rival and later friend in Kidu, seductions, engagement with the gods, parental advice and admonition, uh, quests, grief, death, an intriguing human figure who has gained immortality, but at a cost, uh, but at a cost, Lieutenant Pishtim. Now, the film uh, that was created um, by Marina and Nolene takes the story and gives it a deeply moving, rhythmic presence that is somehow ancient but also very much engaged with this location. So, some words of introduction. Marina Carr is one of Ireland's leading dramatists and uh, with a, a remarkable body of work that includes original plays and adaptations. And she is engaged with classical themes with authors such as Tolstoy and Lorca. She's written uh, dramas such as By the Bog of Cats, which was first pr produced by the Abbey Theatre, the play P Portia Coughlin, uh, and recently I Girl, um, also at the Abbey, and her version of Blood Wedding by Lorca appeared with the Young Vic in London. Uh, Marina is a member of Isdana, and she has an academic appointment at Dublin City University in the School of English. I'm Nolene. Uh, Kevin is artistic director of Magnus. Uh, Magnus, as everyone knows, is a, a theater spectacle company, and it's a position she's held since 2008. Uh, Magnus is a mainstay. <laughs> Can you believe it? <laughs> uh, main, Magnus is a mainstay and anchor of really the cultural and creative life of, of, of Galway, which does visual spectacles, processions, designs, um, a really a unique form of storytelling that I think is, uh, has a well-deserved national and international reputation. Magnus also has a very important community engagement, um, an educational function uh, with projects such as the Spectacle Youth Theatre, uh, which is a free program of events, the work uh, workshops uh, for 14 to 19 year olds uh, who have a passion, and no doubt a, a passion instilled by this opportunity. Now, Marina Nolene's 22 minute film, The Legend of Gilgamesh, was produced for Galway 2020. Uh, clips are available on YouTube. And it's in competition, I think, in various theater festivals, so um, I'm sure uh, various film festivals, I should say, but there are probably opportunities to talk a little bit more about that as we go on. Michael Clark is a professor of classics at NUI Galway. He works on Greek poetry and on the ways in which Greek and Roman texts circulated in the medieval period in Ireland. And he's the author of the recent book, Achilles Beside Gilgamesh, Mortality and Wisdom in Early Epic Poetry, which appeared with Cambridge in 2019. Tonight's event has been organized by Dr. Sarah Corrigan, who's a research fellow in Classicus and Eoi Galway, and it's supported by the university and by the Moore Institute. Without further ado, I have some questions for you, and we'll have plenty of time, by the way, to engage with you as audience members, so we look forward to that. Um, Marina and Noah the first question is really, how did you get on to Gilgamesh? What brought you to this ancient text? Who wants to take that question? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Marina. Um, I was really interested in the origin of, of myth and storytelling and kind of looking at the source, the kind of um, the origin story, really, on the axis in which a lot of these um, epics kind of emerged from. And um, I was really, really curious about Gilgamesh. I was curious about the fact that the kind of one of the oldest um, 
origin stories that was recorded in clay tablets originated in in the middle like in the middle of iraq ancient iraq mm. i thought that was really interesting then i started to explore um all of the kind of the generic themes mm. that started to kind of um pop up as i went through the story mm. and i was really intrigued by the role of hero and anti-hero mm. i was really intrigued mm. by the role of power uh, the origin of society um, mm the role of ritual, the role of sex, the role of morality, um, of culture. Um, and then also, I think, that quest, that struggle that seems to be innate in, in humanity, which is, yeah, the, the role of power um, and leadership. And I think mm. I was really surprised that this ancient story housed all of those elements mm. and more, and also that it very much reflects who we are now. It's like you read that story and you're like, oh, mm. that's us. Yeah. Like, not a lot has changed. Yeah. And how did, you, how, how did you become familiar with it? Is it a story that you knew from a long time ago or you, you'd heard about it but didn't know about it? I kind of, in, in the kind of mythopoetical quest, I had kind of um, formats. But I, um, I got really, I'll tell you, to be really honest, right? Um, I'm a big fan of David Byrne. And David Byrne did an album inspired by Gilgamesh 30 years ago. Oh, and I thought, oh. right. And then oh, Anselm Kiefer, who's a visual artist, yeah. did some, did this triptych of kind of drawings of Gilgamesh. And I was like, these dudes are onto something. And yeah. they're artists that I really loved. And then I kind of, through that portal of music and visual art, I started to um, interrogate the story. Wow. And Marina, how did, how did you become involved? Was this all, also on your imaginative landscape no. where you, became, uh, you were newly arriving to the Gilgamesh story? No, Nolan got in touch with me and asked me, will I write a play based on Gilgamesh, <laughs> basically. <laughs> and, and you uh, said, who? Gilgamesh well, who? Well, Gilgamesh right. who, yeah. <laughs> uh, I had kind of heard mm. and had probably glanced at it in mm. some, you know, probably compendium somewhere, but I can't remember having ever spent any time mm. with it. Um, Did the story have surprises for you when you came to it? Obviously, okay, it's an ancient story. You were prepared to that extent. What, did, it, did it describe or, or work in ways that you were either familiar with or unfamiliar with in terms of a, as, a, as an ancient piece? Um, I found it very difficult mm. to get into this story. Um, I suppose the, <clears throat> you know, the Iliad and the Odyssey, they're smoother in a way. Um, or they've had so many translations, or they're they're further along in in in, in storytelling or in epic form. Um, the frag fragmentary nature of Gilgamesh was hugely problematic. Mm. But then I started thinking about with the wasteland, you know, mm. yeah. and there was something very compelling about the the fragments as well. But Noli and I spent weeks and weeks hammering out how are we ever going to write a play mm -hmm. based on Gilgamesh because mm -hmm. it, it loops back. It's like a gyre, you know, or like yeah. gyres and repetition is a huge yeah. thing in it. And all these incongruous things happen like he's wise at the start, even though he's like 18 and he's built the whole city and he's full of wisdom and he's seen the depths. And then the next thing you hear is that he's raping all the women and he's you know he's building the wall and um he's 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 uncontrollable basically he's like a raging bull in the city um, and it's trying to figure out the chronology of the fragments and what's useful in terms of theater because our initial thing was was um a, a theater piece interesting wow yeah. so you thought you had you imagined it as a full length kind mm. of uh People I've the written theater. a full-length right. theatre yeah. piece. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Wow. Yeah. And has that been staged or is that... Not yeah. yet. Okay. Not yet. No. Oh, we have no. something to look forward to. Dot, yeah. dot, dot. Yeah. <laughs> That's fascinating. Yeah. Wow. Because COVID happened. We were all set 2020. Yeah. yeah. And then COVID happened and everything was shut down. And then we were going to have a theatre piece and then just have it online. I thought, That's ridiculous. Um, and then... Uh, we extrapolated um, certain lines and scenes from the play script wow. that became okay. that were developed further for the film. Yeah. But just to say, um, the film I see as more of Nolene's baby uh, in terms of creative mm. input, um, landscape, and how it's all put yeah. together. The the script is mine, yeah. but um, in terms of the film, that was really your work much more than mine. 
um, I provided the lines, that was it. Mm. But the, the play version, when you do see it, um, will be 50-50, I think. <laughs> <Wonderful>. <laughs> yeah, just, just to get that clear, yeah. do you know. Um, oh, it's something we really yeah. look forward to. I do feel like, I mean, it's timely in the sense we've been through our own epic experiences. I mean, COVID is nothing if not epic. Mm. So these disruptions and huge moments, cataclysms, I think feel like they're part of our yeah. our psyche now so i think there'll be an interesting opportunity to re-engage with something mythic in that way when we get to that stage of yeah. uh, when you can when you can actually well i think it goes back to um what nolan said there at the start we haven't changed no you know mm-hmm. human nature is very slow to evolve it seems and we keep we keep repeating ourselves we keep repeating the traumas we keep having the despots running the world making the decisions for us we keep deferring mm. um we keep, um, we keep getting it all wrong about things like eternity and, you know, we've a very, we've a very kind of distrustful, well in this era, a very distrustful relationship with belief, with eternity, with the idea of immortality. Um, and we have, we've, we've, we've huge problems remembering in a way that can allow us to change. Mm. I think that's what Gilgamesh brought up for of, us. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's fascinating. And so, I mean, do you, do you see Gilgamesh as a, as a kind of psychologically realized figure? I mean, in one, there does seem to be that depth and possibility within. It's not a character, though, as such, in the sense of a fully consistent figure. Don't you say? I'd say that we we found him the most one-dimensional yeah. in the context of trying to excavate the story, mm-hmm. um, and that was really problematic. Yeah. As Marina was saying, you know, you were kind of presented with this complete contrast of um, figurehead and uh, youth. And mm. um, I, I would say as well, like uh, an interpretation of bravery. Mm. But it, it, uh, when, when we dug deeper, we found it very kind of archetypal and, and very singular. And it was really, um, I mean, he ended up being for us quite a pain in the arse, didn't he? We were like, he's quite vain, he's very ego-driven. Yeah. He is, but he became really, what, what I would say is, very much a mirror for the kind of leadership, mm. the kind of, the, the power structure mm. that, that has kind of uh, evolved as a result of that, yeah. mm. you know? He didn't do much. He just no. wrecked everybody's head. And, and destroyed all around him. Yeah. You know, and... and you know, Gilgamesh, I suppose, has within it, um, you know, that great lamentation poetry. But, but I found it really difficult to, to believe um, his, his lamentation and his grief after the death of Enkidu. Mm. Because the next thing he's on the rampage, killing everything in sight and beating up everyone in sight to find immortality, to yeah. meet Utnapishtim. And the reason he wants to meet Uden and is to get the secret of immortal life for himself, so he doesn't have to die. Yeah. Um, so I, I, even his grief, I found it was mm. all about himself. Self indulgence. So <laughs> he's, it's somewhat hollow the idea of his honouring his his departed friend, but this is more in his for the sake of his own. I do, I do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yeah. maybe that's wrong of me, but I find that well, difficult. No, it's, I mean, it's, <coughs> yeah. Can you, you, t- you touch on something really important there, Marina? Because when like when that epic was first kind of packaged, you know, oh. as, as one of the works of great literature on the shelf, mm-hmm. and that maybe goes back to maybe the early 1920s or earlier, they always used to say that he, his best friend dies and he goes off to the edge of the world to find out the secret or the meaning of mm-hmm. life. It's kind of like man's quest for meaning. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that's become clearer over the years is that just like you said, he's not trying to do that at all. He's just trying to live forever. Yeah. Mm. Which is very simplistic in a way, mm. even childish. And of course he fails and maybe learns, or so to say, he is taught, and through him we're taught, mm. uh, truths about the universality of death. Mm. And then he goes back to his city, and I, I, when I teach it, I always find it so hard. He gets back to the city at the end of the 11th tablet, this is the moment when he's going to, you know, share the understanding. And all it says is, repeats the words at the very beginning. Yeah. Mm. Tells you how big the city is and how big its enclosure is. And are we meant to supply the wisdom bit 
probably. The psychologically deep bit ourselves. Yeah. Is, is that what you've done? Or he who's seen the deep. No, mm -hmm. no, we give the wisdom to the gods and to his mother. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to a little bit to Enkidu. Yeah. 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 Enkidu is kind of the tragic figure. In yeah, it, tell I us think. more about Enkidu. He's this really interesting figure yeah. who emerges. Uh, as, as He's the wild man. Forth. So Ishtar, or whichever we call her Ishtar, hmm. um, uh, creates. So, so the women, the women in Uruk are, are going mad because Gilgamesh is, he's a, uh, that kind of what do they call the, the French term for a droit de seigneur? Yeah. So everyone who gets married, he has them for, on their wedding night. So the mothers and fathers and grooms are complaining, and they go to the temple, and Ishtar hears them, and she decides as a way of controlling Gilgamesh, she's going to create a, this wild man called Enkidu and she makes him out of clay and um, he runs with the deer um, and the gazelle and he's brought up by them and he's you know he drinks in the streams and so it's kind of Garden of Eden stuff, he's mm -hmm. innocent and then Gilgamesh, uh, word of it gets out there that some trapper comes and says you know he's freeing all the animals and etc and Gilgamesh sends Shamhat out, and Shamhat is kind of the temple, one of the temple women, prostitute if you like, one of the pleasure women, to go out and seduce Enkidu, and in other words, tame him, um, civilize him, and all that entails. But part of that, and, and she goes out, she does all of that, and she brings him back. But part of that civilizing is, um, is how I suppose how how malleable Enkidu becomes from this beautiful wild creature mm. to this kind of tame civilized who's at Gilgamesh's beck and call, and who ends up going with Gilgamesh to the cedar forest to kill the beautiful Humbaba, in our in our version anyway, the beautiful Humbaba, <laughs> the guardian of the forest. Yeah, and he's kind of yeah. um, there was a kind of a. There was a Shakespearean theme to that as well, because in some of the fragments, mm. there's a reference to that area, isn't there? The Cedar Forest yeah. where Enkidu grew up. Yeah. Like yeah. he ran with the gazelles mm. in this beautiful kind of mm. paradise. Yeah. Paradise. Yeah. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm drawing on really, really, really obvious metaphors here, but it is about that kind of indigenous, mm. kind of wild nature sensibility yeah. versus our colonized. Um, capitalist sensibility mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the reason that Gilgamesh goes in there in the first place is he's, he's running out of cash you know and he, he wants to show off and show his neighbours that he's bigger and better than them all mm -hmm. and he's also raging mm -hmm. because he is not immortal yeah. mm -hmm. because he's uh, uh, he's, you know, three parts human, one part God, or two parts, or Jesus, mm. it was changing all the time. <laughs> but he was raging that he, he couldn't live forever. And so the way that he wanted to make, make his mark, was, that mm. was actually in the original tablet, was yeah. his legacy was to annihilate mm. this beautiful place and to mine it for its amber. Mm. And therefore he would become mm. remembered mm. as a result. And Enkidu, who grew up in this place, mm. this is what we found really interesting, who was of this place, kind of went in and went along with it. Mm. Against his better it, judgment. Against his better mm. judgment. Mm. And there was something really uh, archetypal in that as well, wasn't there, Marina? Because mm. it was kind of felt like, it's like where the child returns home to kill the parent. Yeah. And it was, it was, a, re it was a real moment. Yeah. Um, and then uh, that, that really, that was very informative, I think, in the context of how, what Enkidu represented yeah. in the play for you anyway, for sure, I think. Yeah. And how to kind of address that and that dynamic, mm -hmm. you know? It was fascinating the, the way the two interact with each other and the kind of moments of fear and misgiving, but it's almost as if the relationship between them is, is the driver rather than necessarily goals that they appoint for each other. It evolves in a curious kind of way. Yeah, I mean, he's, Enkidu is part, I was thinking, well, he's part comrade, part, you know, the comet and the axe dreams that, mm -hmm. that Gilgamesh has before Enkidu arrives. And mm -hmm. his mother, Ninsun, who's the goddess, Lady mm -hmm. Wild Cow, interprets the dreams for him. So in a way, he is, he is the kind of the divine thing, but he's also the axe. He's the thing that's going to destroy Gilgamesh in the end mm. and destroy himself. 
But I suppose on a human level, what interests me about the, the Gilgamesh and Kido, they talk about, you know, is it the first great um, homosexual relationship depicted in literature? Um, is it the first great friendship um, depicted? Um, and I, I just, it, but the, because we have so few fragments, it's, you have to, mm. you have to fill in bits yeah, for those to work, and you know, in, yeah. um, because otherwise they, because in, in one fragment, Gilgamesh is ordering him about the place, and the next fragment he's, he's weeping and wailing and tearing his hair out because he's dead. But, um, you know, you try, you try and find what was the, what was the pulse there? So for me, actually, it wasn't the great driving force. It, I mean, the, Enkidu is kind of the catalyst, I mm -hmm. think. Right. Mm -hmm. right. You know, yeah. that allows yeah. the, the second part yeah. of it of it to play out. And he's also very connected to the gods, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think there's Ishtar and Enlil. Then that'll be the other. Uh, they were the gods that appealed to us. I yeah, think. very much mm -hmm. so. And, and there was well, through Marina's brilliant writing. There was a, a, to actually we found more humanity in the gods and yeah. more interpersonal yeah. relationship in the gods yeah. than we did in the Bukaldonas, like yeah. in the boys, you know, yeah. because um, as we uh, as we were saying, we found um, Gilgamesh so one dimensional. Like mm. it was really, uh, I think it's really interesting that you say you expect your natural inclination is to kind of have that hero's journey with them, isn't it? Where you go, we yeah. want to learn how, yeah. you know, he's experienced mm. these mm. terrible things. His his bestie has died. Mm. He is going to reflect. He's going to, you know, take note and, um, and do something about it. And actually what kind of horrified us and fascinated us was that uh, it, was about, it, oh, it ended up being all about him. Mm. You know, and the gods created, had much more for us, kind of, they cared about consequence in some ways, didn't mm. they? And they had rites and rituals and... Mm laws and ways of being mm. that that seemed to speak much more of an interpersonal relationships and consequence and grief mm. and mm. loss than mm. Gilgamesh and Enkidu's choices mm. and behaviour. Mm. Yeah, mm. I think, yeah, I think there's something about that around the kind of the death of the sacred in our lives that is that is huge in Gilgamesh. Mm. And that would be one mm. of the things mm. that I would take from that. And I think that that journey is kind of showing that kind of last tenuous connection between Im the immortals and the mortals. Mm -hmm. And that for me is probably the most fascinating thing about Gilgamesh. Mm -hmm. um, and then Utanapishtim was the other character that we adored, your mm -hmm. man who can't die. Yeah, he can never die. <laughs> but he's just left there. You Watching know? us yeah. over and yeah. over and over again. Yeah. It doesn't seem to be such a great reward after all. No, this. it's no. not. Yeah. No, he's dying to be put in the clay, you know, yeah. in yeah. our version anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's fascinating. That's interesting. Yeah. Michael, can I ask you about, yeah. the, about the, the role of the gods in this, and, yeah. and maybe if you would compare it perhaps to Greek mythology, I mean, they're certainly active in the world. They can be appealed to. They have personality. Um, do you see connections there? Is that part of this kind of ancient landscape, or would you see it as quite different to well, agree? There, there's certainly a, a huge depth of connection in that the, the basic way of seeing the gods and their relationship with mortals really carries on to Greek culture. It's, it's mostly the same with different names. Uh, but within Gilgamesh, the great gods are so vividly imagined, I think especially Ninsun, mm. the mm. mother who's, yeah. and she cares, and it's the most basic and ordinary of human relationships. Mm. Uh, but they're very distant and remote as well, I think, basically because they can't die and they can't suffer pain. So they're not caught up in the same circles of sorrow mm -hmm. that we are or the, 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 the human characters are. But of course, the story is set at a very particular point in imagined prehistory when gods and mortals were very close mm. before they'd been separated out mm. so that means that gilgamesh is always is always kind of aspiring to nearly be like a god mm. Mm. and when ishtar comes down and fancies him and mm. uh, he and especially enkidu says no i won't have you that's, I, I would see near that as the, the moment of 
the guy is like rising up to the very height of unreflective, I suppose pride is the word, something like that, but they've just gone too high up. And then that moment when Gilgamesh asks the women of the city, you know, who is the finest of fellows? And they all answer, Gilgamesh is the finest of fellows you know. You know, it's, and that's, that's where the archetypal thing comes. Mm. You feel it's like the story of like Tony O'Reilly or somebody like that, just <laughs> going up, he's gone too high, yeah. and he's going to come crashing down. And they, I think, I, for me at least, the, the geometry of that. You know, you rise up high, and then there's a question mark, something happens. Is it, is it pride or madness or just getting lazy in middle age or something? Yeah, <laughs> I, I also wonder as well, is it something about it was there some crucial shift happening as well in world order? Let's say, you know, mm. we all, women have their fantasies about, oh, in, in some Eden there may have been a bit of a matriarchy, or not even, but there may have been a bit more equality. Mm. And just like the power the female, the goddesses have in Gilgamesh, compared to, let's say, uh, in, in the Bible, the lack mm. of power that most women mm. have in the New Testament anyway, maybe in the Old Testament's a bit more. But... Um, these, like Ishtar is quite powerful and her revenge is it's mm. quite severe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you know, yeah. Uh, they do they do have impact. Um, likewise, in Lille has impact. Uh, he's the one who orders the, the killing of Enkidu or the death of Enkidu. Um, and they have this conclave. And then, of course, that incredible image, which first appears in literature, the maggot coming out of the nose. Mm. Um, I mean, it, it, it's, it's full, in, the fragments are full of these incredible images around uh, death and, and decay as they are of, of beauty. For example, the passages where the cedar forest is described um, and the amber and the cedar trees and um, all of that. So, I mean, yeah, I've lost the thread of what I'm saying now. now just I want to ask you actually about Ishtar and that kind of moment that Michael was referring to of, of the refusal of mm. Ishtar. And did, does that, how do, you, how do you interpret that moment? Do, do you see that coming or, or is it, there's an element of surprise that, I mean, this could be the elevation of Gilgamesh to some yet higher level? Yeah, it, it could be if she married, but she, he lists out the six mm. lovers that she's killed. And Ishtar is, <laughs> I mean, he's probably quite sensible, you know. She's killed all our lovers. And he's, so, so she is. He's the right, not the law. <laughs> yeah. so, there, there, there's one of them. I, Balance I, of probabilities <laughs> is not favourable. There, there's one of those lovers that there's a few of them not known from anywhere else. The stories. Yeah. So it's as if he's, he's drawing on, on an ocean of stories that haven't survived anywhere else. But there's one of them where he names one of them and says, you turned him into a... And I found one of the translators had put frog, and one of them had put dwarf, and one of them had put mole. And there's a debate about what the word means, but it's yeah. some sort of, sort of creepy transformation. Yeah. And it reads to me like a, a, the fear of mm. matriarchy anyway, yeah. the fear of the powerful woman, mm. if not a memory of an earlier period when mm. matriarchy was a social norm. And of course, it's right out of fairy tales as well, you know, yeah. the frog mm. prince, yeah. Indeed. Yeah. 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 all of yeah. that. Yeah. 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 I mean, Sexuality, and you alluded to this at, at your beginning remarks, is such an interesting feature of the story. I mean, oh, it, yes. it's, it's a graphic is maybe not the right word to use, but it's, it's, it's powerful and present. And I, 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 what I enjoyed about that story originally was doing some of the research on, um, on the societal, like mm. whatever kind of historical sensibilities I could pick up from what the basis of society was then, you know? And so, you know, we were talking about Uruk where the city was set, you know, they, 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 they described it as a city of temples and canals, you know, lapsalizuli walls mm -hmm. where festivals went on all night and women of the erotic arts, like it was all, um, it was, it sounded, it was very uh, visceral for me, yeah. the whole thing. And what I liked about it was, I think in some ways, I liked the fact that it, it, it had an openness of interpretation to it, mm. where, um, where, you know, over the years, you know, we've gotten really categorized in our, in our uh, norms or in our sensibilities or ways of expressing ourselves. Whereas in this kind of really interesting, I thought it was interesting that Marina was asking about that shift in time, as much as it was shifting with the gods and the humans, I feel like commerce is coming in, 
uh, business was coming in, industry was coming in, but there were rites and rituals and um, uh, things in play um, that, that were there before all of that. And like Ishtar's temple was one of those places. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it was a place of worship for her. Mm. And also it was in the original text, it talked about being um, a priestess of the erotic arts mm. and that it was used as a kind of a magical tool as opposed to like that it was a power, something yeah. to be respected mm. as much as as well as something to be enjoyed, as well as something to be taken advantage of, mm. you know, mm. but also the homoeroticism of the story wasn't the axis of the story. Mm. We were really mm. interested in that. Yeah. It wasn't just like, oh, look, here's um, here's a story about gender. It wasn't. Mm. It was what we found fascinating about it was that it's the story of humanity. It is the story of love. It is the story of the abuse of love. And Marina, you said to me at one point, Jesus, like, it's always about men. Do you know what I mean? The first love story, of course, that exists between two fellas. Like, do you know what I mean? And, I, I mean, that, that was that's just where we were at in the conversation and our interpretation. Like, that's not a that's not a literal fact. Yeah. But there's a what I think what I liked about it, Michael was was that there was a kind of um, there there wasn't a specificness. There was nothing rooted in. The, you know, um, in, in, those, uh, in, in those elements. It allowed the imagination yeah. to travel and it allowed you to kind of interrogate yeah. um, those stories. Like one of my favourite things about the Ishtar Gilgamesh yeah. um, rejection is, yeah. is that, um, you know, the, the, the vigour with which those boys went to attack the bull of heaven. Like, I mean, it wasn't just a feck off, like, yeah. mm. it was an absolute annihilation and a slaughtering. Mm. But there was that moment that we loved, you remember, where Enkidu takes the thigh of the bull mm. and Ishtar standing on the wall, just like outside mm. there, you know, yeah. stand on the wall, I'd say, with the skirt up, ready to <laughs> rage at them. And, and Enkidu takes the thigh, can yeah. you? Feck for that. Yeah. Mm. And then she has a funeral. Yeah. for the thigh of the bull. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? She yeah. has a funeral for the thigh. Yeah. And we just loved all of those kind mm. of um, power plays, rejections, engagements. It was constantly evolving and changing. It was not mm. typical mm. to what we mm. would consider mm. typical today. Yeah. Would mm. that be fair to say? Absolutely. That's its strangeness and I suppose its fascination. That yeah. It's not immediately understandable yeah mm. um, and you can't find all the correlations yeah mm. in today from there so you have to make the leap yeah mm. yeah. yeah michael i'm going to ask you about the so gilgamesh is two two-thirds god one-third human yeah. i'm not quite sure how no, the it's quite precise are. it's it's quite precise okay. in the original that that that's how the proportions are you yeah. know quite, not entirely sure how that works but um, well no it, it works if you work it out with his parentage because okay. his how is it? His mother is a goddess. Well, it's not quite two thirds. His mother is a goddess. <laughs> his dad is mortal, and his dad's father was a god. So it's somewhere between three quarters and two thirds. Wow! Yeah. So but uh, I was amazed to find the figure is in the original is precisely like it's they're mathematical terms. You know, two thirds and yeah. one third. Yeah. Wow! Yeah. There's something to that. I mean, Babylonian mathematics. I think it's, yeah, oh, it's a big is, thing. Yeah, it's yeah. sophisticated. Absolutely. Absolutely. It is. Uh, it's, it's, it's nearly been rediscovered in the last uh, generation by Eleanor Robson, who began as a math student. And uh, in Warwick University, she had a sort of a random course on history of mathematics. And the guy who wrote it, a uh, marvel, absolutely marvellous uh, man, he had a few lectures on Babylonian mathematics. And she just grabbed Eleanor Robson, and she's become the world expert in it since. But the maths. And astrology is one of their astrology great Astrology was huge, yeah. 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 And then that's probably an important point about the sophistication of this, the culture of this is emerging from. It is, there are traces of it in, in the poem itself. Yes. Uh, and also of the, of the riches, the natural resources, the, the yeah. cedars, yeah. you think of Lebanon and the uh, cedars yeah. of Lebanon. It does evoke a, a quite a rich world, but also the world of the steppe and of, of remote yeah. spaces as well as part of the imagination. Mm. We, we come to Mesopotamia, is Iraq. And if we're brought up, as I guess most of us in this room are, with a Euro European centered perspective, I guess the first way you think of that is somewhere remote, somewhere nearly desert, and somewhere that's been torn apart by, 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 by war in our own time. And yet, if you go back to 1400 BC or whatever, that was the center of 
everything that was going to become mm. civilization, including Europe. Mm. You know, yeah. Greece and places like that were just mm. the kind of the Western edge. It changes the perspective. Mm. Uh, and it, that sense of the richness of the city mm. that you both mentioned, it's a very powerful reminder of how, I suppose, how fecund and how full of life and potential mm. the world of those, those first city-states mm. was. Yeah. I was just reading back, there was something like 80,000 people in Uruk, you know? Mm. Which is huge for this yeah. period. Massive. It's yeah. really yeah. 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 And also the architecture of the city was yeah. like that, you know, when you were talking about the beginning of the poem and the end of the poem, like that sense of, of achievement and what they yeah. had constructed and built. And mm. it, was, it was extraordinary as well. Mm. Mm -hmm. And when you were talking about the mathematics, we were trying to, in the making of the giant, Kubits is a Kubits, Michael. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we were really fascinated by that. Oh, okay. the, trying to trying to trying to match the measurements of what we thought the height they were refer, yeah. were referring to. Yes. In 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 trying to match that on the puppet. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That, that's it's really interesting because I, I I should mention that there's a there's another scholar called Irvin Finkel, who's in the British Museum, and uh, yeah. he had a, do you know this, he had a great story that he every so often if you're a curator there. You have to be the guy on the desk that the public come into. And this guy came into him, and I suppose it was sometime in the 90s, and he had this Mesopotamian clay tablet. You just dig them up in the desert. And uh, I think his father or his grandfather had given it to him, and lo and behold, it was a bit of a Gilgamesh text. And more than that, it gave a description of exactly how to build the the boat of Udinapashti, which is basically the ark. Yeah. Wow. And he made one. <laughs> wow. Uh, he, made, he made it himself according to the instructions, and, yeah. and, and it worked. Because wow. there, there is an ark story, a flood and, yeah. Uh, yeah. story in, yeah. in, in, in the poem yeah. itself, which is one of the fascinating yeah. things to think of the shared mm. yeah. mythological the, space. That, that like. was the moment when it first sort of hit, I don't know, we would say Western European culture in, I think, in the late 19th century when uh, George Smith in the British Museum was deciphering a Gilgamesh tablet and lo and behold it's about this ark and the guy on the boat <laughs> and sending out a raven and sending out a dove and that made headlines in the London newspapers mm. Mm. hold on this is the flood of Noah yeah. and it's not alone in the Hebrew Bible and what came after in the West it was already there mm. in, uh, in Mesopotamian stories so that figure wrote in Apishti uh, he has so many names in so mm. many languages. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating. Could I ask you a little bit about the, the filmmaking sure. side of it? And well, obviously we associate Magnus with, with street theater, mm -hmm. and with, obviously with puppets. It doesn't seem to do justice to call them puppets. I don't think conjures. Does anybody who's encountered them that powerful sense of, yeah, is, is really palpable. And you've, you've, you've managed to preserve that in the film. But how, have you made films before? Was this a new departure for you creatively? Or? Yeah, I had never made a film before. Wow. Um, and uh, so this was, this was, I suppose this is the first, the first time really. And, it, um, you know, I know it was amazing uh, collaborating with you, Marina, on that because you were so generous and so supportive. You know, I was taking the text of this brilliant playwright and I was, you know, yet again coming up against a, a COVID rhetoric of what are we going to do, you know? And the, just the generosity of being able to, to go to a creative collaborator and go, I was thinking of doing this visual poem and setting it in the west of Ireland with these um, Mesopotamian characters, you know, how are we going to do that? And, um, but you had such a rich tapestry of language um, that it was like extracting these gossamer threads from the from the play and kind of trying to find stanzas. I think that's how we mm. approached it, mm. to go back to the original kind of poetic structure and to try and do that mm. uh, in the film. And the film is more, I, I kind of feel like a better word for it is a visual poem. Yeah. Mm. Because I think it's, um, that's, that's what it felt like when we were making it as well, you know? It is very rhythmic, definitely. Yeah, yeah. And it, ha and it, ha it certainly has atmosphere, mood, it's suggestive, mm. um, but it's also visually very striking, very powerful. Um, yeah, I mean, and what, what, into, there's obviously multiple locations, and mm. you're playing off of the relationship. There's, there's the Uruk, 
equivalent, yes. if you like. And then there's this other remote landscape. So how did you, how did you work that out? And uh, yeah. how did we find that? Yeah. yeah. Well, one of the things that um, in our early iterations and conversations, I, th I found a parallel between the city of Uruk and the city of Galway. Uh, in, in its descriptions and moods, mm. you know, when you talk about, particularly at that time, the center of the universe um, was in ancient Iraq and festivals were, you know, it was, it was, I felt it was like one of the most exciting places mm. at, at that time in the world where everything was happening. Mm. And I think that there was, um, I suppose there was a kind of a symbiosis of going you know, the description of the city of Uruk, Galway is a city that is, um, has the canals, its own version of temples and practices. Mm. And I, I found a real kind of synergy there. Also, I found in the landscape of Connemara and of the Burren, mm. I went, uh, you know, I thought of the ancient Lebanese landscapes. Mm. And although the mountains are different, there is, a, there is an abyss and a beauty mm. and, a, and a kind of a, a, a shared palette mm. between um, some of the landscape of Roundstone uh, and Connemara and of, of the kind of Mayo Galway border that when I looked at images and um, films set in, um, in Iraq that weren't dissimilar in palette and colour mm -hmm. and shape. And also it was about the isolation and the abyss of that mm. landscape as well with this kind of uh, civilization on, you know, all you know around it you know mm. so i i loved that and um marina's writing and the use of language and the um i suppose the interpretation of that language from an ancient iraqi story into somewhere that was influenced by our sensibility and your language uh, mm. in ireland really uh, really sprung me into action around um Go, you know, excavating the burren yeah. for Ishtar, the limestone, granite, mm. the ancientness of that landscape mm. seemed to resonate with the ancientness of the story. The mm. tablets, the clay, mm. the limestone. Yeah. Omi Island. Yeah, Omi Island was yeah. amazing. Wow. Um, yeah. was, Omi <coughs> Island was beautiful because it had mm. a poet, poetic resonance for both of us. Yeah. Mm. Uh, anyway, just as artists, I think. Yeah. Mm. Um, but also there is the, with Uta Nepishtim, Jesus, it's like your heart to go out to that character, you know, <laughs> just traveling the world endlessly, <laughs> just wanting to die. And there was something beautiful about casting Sean yeah. in that role as well, where yeah. he's just, he understands that landscape, he yeah. understands your text, yeah. and he, he, it's, um, it's in his bones, yeah. you know. And it was amazing to have that space, it had that sense of abyss for us, mm. and yeah. also the edge of the world. It yeah. had that kind of mm. edge of the worldness mm. where he's travelled to, yeah. and that Absolutely. felt. Yeah. So that's you know, oh, I, I was also really lucky with, <coughs> with Colm Hogan, who's the cinematographer. I was going to ask you he about the cinematography. Yeah. You know, his yeah. his sense of space and place is amazing, and I yeah. have to mention Orla Claher, who's yeah. the designer of the work, um, working with Julian, I suppose, who was meant to be here but mm. couldn't. But really, Orla and the, her team, her yeah. art department, really took that. So they, they did the set design then? Oh yeah, the, yeah they, you know, that, was, that was the interior and, are. and the, yeah. the freelance artists that she worked with in Machnus yeah. uh, took that to an extraordinary level. Mm. Yeah. And, um, and, and, uh, and Nick's Powell soundtrack just underscored mm. it. So it was a mixture of the natural mm. landscape of where we come from, yeah. that amazing epic story, Marina's extraordinary interpretation of it, mm. you know, Colm's golden eye and Orla's uh, astounding ability to, and Cherie's costumes were amazing as well. It was, mm -hmm. and the actors who we were really lucky with the amazing performers we got. Yeah, yeah. They just were a tapestry of, it was just an amazing cacophony of, of edge and beauty and um, poetry and purpose that came together in the end. Yeah, I think that's, so, that describes it beautifully, I think. It's nice. Had yeah, you worked nice. in, a, in a film medium before yourself? Or? Uh, I've done little bits and pieces, but nothing, nothing like this. I really enjoy that. Yeah. Uh, we were saying we were accidental filmmakers. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everybody no. was making films during COVID because yeah. uh, you know all the theatre had to go online. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, it's a wonderful medium. Um, 
Is it something you think you might go back to? Is it a sort of enticed you a little bit? Or? With Nolene, I would, because she has a real poet's <laughs> eye. Um, yeah. yeah, but I'd be, it, I'd be very choosy because, yeah. because uh, well, I don't know, the little bit I know about film, you know, there are five million script editors sitting on your neck and they yeah. rewrite your film if they don't like it. Yeah, and, that's a slippery you know, slope, I yeah, think. So. Yeah, so you'd have to be careful. Um, yeah who you'd be working with. We'd end up like William Faulkner or one of these other <laughs> frustrated <laughs> figures. Who, well, uh, yeah, Scott with. Fitzgerald out in Hollywood yeah, going mad. Yeah, yeah. There are a few know. cautionary tales there <laughs> too. Uh, the you, crack off, my crack off, is that what the crack off is? Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's it, that's it. He's did fine. you, and in terms of the length of the film, did you, had, had you in mind a kind of length or where did, where did, how did you arrive at that? I think that the yeah. story, I think that I felt like we needed to house we need a character to kind of to draw from in, in, in the poem, in the visual poem. And Uta Nepishtam, the character kind of led. So in a lot of ways, it was really fascinating because I had actually, to be totally honest, like I had no, I, I was just like, I didn't know where I was going to go with it, you know. Mm. But then in the editing, this, is a whole, this was a mm. whole new world, sitting with this amazing editor. Mm. Um, Keith, who's just a total ledge bag, and he had, you know, you, you had to construct what you thought was in your head mm. when you went into the room, you were presented with something completely different, and that was terrifying. And we mm. talked about the fragments the whole time of the story, and I was, I was saying to Keith, oh my God, like, what are we going to do with this? How do we piece this mm. jigsaw together? So in a lot of ways, this, the the length of the piece was a kind of a negotiation in the editing suite yeah. around kind of it was like writing another it was like visually yeah. writing something different again yeah. i remember isn't hindsight fabulous like i remember afterwards a, a lovely friend of mine an artist who's made a feature film and she was going oh because I, I literally vomited i came out of the editing suite and i was like i had to say to keith listen i have to i have to leave you I, I, I'll come back to you because I was so terrified of, mm. of, of this unknown, you know. And she said really nonchalantly afterwards, oh, yeah. She's like, when you go in, nobody tells you that you have to make three films. The one that's in your head, mm. the one that you shoot, and then the one that la lands in the editing suite. Yeah. And that's something I'll never forget mm. because um, it, that dictated... The, the, the rhythm, the metronome mm -hmm. of the piece yeah. came as a result of yeah. uh, that negotiation with what you're presented, all the fragments that you're left with mm. yeah. and how you piece that together. And um, the VO and Marina's words, it, it was like trying to put a really intricate jigsaw puzzle together with the writing, the visuals, mm. the original story, yeah. the landscape and the music. Mm. Mm. Um, and do you think you'll work again on that medium uh, I, I, I would I love I, I, I would be very curious and excited to do something with Marina I think mm. in that context mm. um, and also with Orla and Julian in the in the mm. in the bigness of what you could bring I think we're interested in the gods mm. and I think the film style the panoramicness of it allows mm. breath for the gods mm. in a way yeah. mm. uh, that seems to befit them yeah, and you do, I was saying at the beginning, I, it's, there's some f film festivals, I think, it's, yes. it's being shown in, is that right? Yeah, yes. What, uh... Uh, it, so that is, it's kind of going out doing its own thing, you know, mm -hmm. when you make a piece of work and then you just, it's done. Mm -hmm. yeah. So at the moment, I think it's going out around the world to different film festivals in Northern Europe, in Iraq, in wow. Asia, in mm -hmm. India. I mean, it's kind of mad when you think wow. about it because yeah. you, you never think about the work going yeah. anywhere beyond where it just is yeah. mm. but because it's a visual poem and um, it's a kind of an unusual mm. um format so it's what's wonderful about it is it's like classicists are interested in it mm. academics are interested in it visual artists mm. writers mm. and um, poets performance artists are interested in it so it's it's attracted a lot of curiosity from a lot of kind of um, really esoteric and diverse festivals mm. of film. Wow. Wow. So that'll be gas. Yeah. It'll also work very well in 
uh, in galleries, I would yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in galleries, yeah, as an installation piece, yeah, an installation mm -hmm. piece yeah. as well. It, it, yeah. It's interesting that you made so much of the wild landscape mm. in that because that's, I think it's also an aspect of the original epic that isn't really mirrored in mm. familiar European literary culture in quite the same way that the what they call the desert, which means the wild places, it might as well be Connemara or Arana somewhere. Mm. It's, it's where characters go to mourn, as Gilgamesh does. Mm. But in some sense, it's also where people go to find truth as well. Mm. And I think that has continued, as I understand it, continued in Near Eastern culture and in, in Muslim culture, mm. uh, in mm. ways that are not so familiar in a European context, that you go out into the desert yeah, like Cleopatra. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. well, that's that. There's that a nomadic that nice pilgrimage. Nice. Yes, yeah. indeed. Yeah. There's, a, there's a direct continuity yeah. there from yeah. the, the monks of the Egyptian desert to mm. the monks of the the wild places. I mean, yeah. desertum means a, a place with no people, not a Colour not a place where there are no trees. Right. Yeah, I think that's really interesting, mm. Michael, that you said that because mm. where we set Ishtar mm. in the film. Was, was we were really, really privileged and really lucky because there's a farmer in Clare who gave us access to this land on the Burren. And we were really conscious that we were walking on landscape that was nearly a million years old. Yeah. It was mm -hmm. really amazing. Mm -hmm. And there was 2,200 handmade skulls yeah. that we placed like up there. It was oh. kind of extraordinary. And mm. we had... Um, we had a 6,000 year old bog oak throne. Like mm. everything was considered in the mm. landscape that you were playing in. Mm. Because Ishtar would demand it as well. Like yeah. it really terrified <laughs> you coming nice and going, why you know, oh, yeah. you know, Where are you going with your plaster? You know, I, need, I, need, I, need I need a place of great import. Yeah. And where, mm. we, where we set it was kind of in the, in the valley of where John O'Donoghue grew up. Mm. So for me, he's a he's a, a poet and a mystic mm. that I would have just gotten a lot of personal resource from. Mm. So it's kind of amazing, kind of yeah. mounting up, you know, and having the queen of the dead, mm. you know, mm. of sex, war, fertility yeah. and death yeah. sit mm. on this ancient wild landscape mm. with nothing around her. Mm -hmm just mm. contemplating what she was going mm. to do with Gilgamesh mm. was kind of extraordinary yeah. and I think really fitting for that character. Mm. That's quite a portfolio that uh, she has. Yeah, she's <laughs> she, does. she carries a lot like of her shoulders busy. now to this star. She's very Dark. busy with yeah. those titles, yeah. Yeah. you know. But yeah. I, again, it was amazing that wildness was key, just like for Uta and Apishtam, the loneliness needed to be met, not only internally in the character, but physically represented in mm. where they were set. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. was key, yeah. really, to the piece, yeah. you know? We have time for some questions from the audience. Before we do that, so if you've got something in mind you want to ask about, do, 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 do be contemplating that. Michael, I want to ask you uh, just an historical question about how, how have these tablets and fragments arrived to us and, and when, were they, when were they found? I mean, presumably over a long period of time, but when were the first major discoveries made? Uh, basically the second half of the 19th century. So and quite recently, in yeah, effect. I mean, in, in, term, you know, how, in terms of how, uh, yeah. how, how our usual sense of the long continuity of classical traditions works, it's really very recent. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, the way the tablets were, most of them, uh, preserved in the first place, as I understand it, there's, there's two reasons. One is that being a scribe in ancient Mesopotamia was not just a, you know, a copying skill. They were the intellectuals. They were the, the public intellectuals, and their schools were centers of the preservation of texts and the, the recopying of texts. Plus kings, especially Assyrian kings, just as they demonstrated their power by having slaves and tribute from every land in the world, or a, a garden with animals from every land in the world, you have a storehouse or a library, probably mm -hmm. in the local town, one of the local temples, with every text that matters. And so that's where you get the first kind of canonical libraries. Yeah. So, and are, are, they, are they literally stone fragments? They're clay. They're clay. They're clay. They're clay. They're clay. And you, sure. you, you. Um, in the, in, in the hot desert sun, you, you roll them out, you, you write on them with a, 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 a sort of a stylus that produces this, this wedge-shaped wedge writing, 
Uh, you have to be a professional to do it because there are so many thousands of signs with different meanings. Uh, then they bake it in the sun. Now that won't preserve it forever, but ain't the ancient world being what it is, whenever one of these libraries or storehouses was in a palace that got destroyed by fire, that bakes the tablets so hard that they're going to yeah. last. So wow. if a, a kiln, so it becomes a strange, kiln or something. Wow. wow. And then Amazing. zingle, it, it just disappears from about the 200 BC on. Yeah. The, 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 the whole tradition disappears. Yeah. And it was, mm -hmm. it was an astonishing story how they rediscovered it in the late 19th century. First with Old Persian, uh, then Babylonian, and eventually Sumerian, the most exotic of them all, and there, there mm. are others too. But it's an incredible intellectual adventure. And just, I'm, just from dabbling in it, the, uh, I can't say how much admiration I have for the scholars who've done it. Mm. Above all, Andrew George, mm. who yeah, the three of us have met here and who've been talking about, who made the thing accessible you know, to outsiders who could come as uh, pick up a bit of the language, sort it out, and suddenly you can see the, the questions that are still unanswered. Mm. And talking to him, it's the maddest thing. I, I met him once, we had him over here as a speaker, and you'd ask him, you know, do you think such and such, you know, passage, what does it mean, the next passage that's missing? And he'd say, yes, we don't know yet. Because he's just waiting for the next tablets that are going to come out of the yeah. desert somewhere. Yeah, that's wonderful. And actually. from his point of view, that he reckons they'll have the complete, the complete epic of Gilgamesh with no words missing. Yeah. Um, maybe it'll take a few more generations, a few more wars to. So we'll see well, the well, nice Gilgamesh at some point. We'll see, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the, that's the thing. The contemplates of sure. repents of his <laughs> ways and uh, yeah, regrets his <laughs> misdoings. I, 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 yeah. I feel like there are so many moments mm. in the epic when. Mm. You want that guy. Yeah. And it, madly, uh, one of the old Babylonian fragments, so about 500 years earlier than the standard version, has this absolutely beautiful scene where he goes down to the sea and Shiduri, the goddess who has a kind of an inn down at the sea, starts talking wisdom to him about how you'll never find the life that you seek. Mm. It's the most beautiful passage, but it seems that it was left out of the standard Babylonian version, right. the one they did in about 1400 BC. Mm -hmm. Maybe as if the, the editor of that version didn't want there to be any easy answers here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Something like that. that. That's just a guess, like, but it's yeah. so strange. And Michael, wasn't there a series of poems, am I wrong on this now? The story of Bilbamesh. Bilgamesh, that's, yeah. the, that's the Sumerian version. Yeah, yeah. which is really yeah. interesting because in that, mm. um, I was very taken with the idea that Enkidu used to travel down to the underworld. Yeah. Am I right on this? Yeah, no, he, he, he does once. There's this strange story, the, yeah, the Sumerian one, where he's playing ball. It's like kind of like a, a hurley and a it's slit a there the nearly, ball, like, and, mm. and he loses them. They go down to the underworld. Mm. So he goes and sees these visions, basically of how miserable it is if you're not remembered. Mm. And for some reason, and it's one of the things that even Andrew George can't explain, I think, the, in the monumental version, Tablets 1 to 11 are complete in themselves. They bring you back to the beginning of the story. He goes back to the city. And then they tacked on a 12th tablet, which is translated from that old Sumerian one about, okay. about uh, Enkidu getting trapped in the underworld. And there's, as far as I can see, despite all the brilliance that the specialists have given it, there's no explanation for why they added that on the end. <laughs> I don't know. There's definitely some intriguing questions about closure, for sure. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. Um, there is, a, you know, the the movement back to Uruk, yeah. but it's not like oh, we've resolved everything. Yeah, that's what I love about it. it doesn't feel it doesn't no. have that note of of, of, a, of an ending. So Actually, I think part of what you're mm. both talking about, if I if I can put it this way, is that that absence of closure, that absence of easy morals and easy endings. Mm. Plus, maybe the very fact that the poem is not even complete mm. gives gives you a freedom to create and recreate and to continue the process mm. in new forms. There's, there's yeah, no well one there are avenues version. for you to get in. Mm. I think. Yeah. 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 yeah, definitely. Yeah. And yeah. what I what I found refresh initially, we found it absolutely head melting when you're trying mm. to think about making a theatre piece and how you mm. conclude the story. Mm. 
But I, I felt on a personal level, what I found really interesting is, is I felt like there was a parallel to how we live our lives. Mm. Like it's just, a ne- it's, you don't know. Mm. There's no kind of neat yeah. box at the end that mm. you can kind of just wrap a bow around it and mm. go, well, isn't that mm. great now? Mm. You know, it's, it's a mm. constant excavation. Mm. And I mm. loved, it's a real challenge as well to work with an unfinished story. Mm. Yeah, and also I think it encompasses all mm. the genres because we can be a bit tight mm. you know, about our genres, your tragedy mm. and your comedy mm-hmm. and your tragic comedies yeah. and mm. your epic and your satire, etc. Yeah. But it seems, it seems to carry all of those. Mm. Yeah. And it's, it's as if the, the way people thought and wrote and created then it is, we, we are talking about the oral tradition. So each storyteller or each poet would tell it differently, probably, according to their mood. Um, and, but also that the, the arc we tend to use, you know, which comes down really from you know, the Aristotelian idea of catharsis, you know, unity of place and time. And that's so you have your build and you have, you have your, your hero or your anti-hero and you have a crisis and then you have the high point and then you have the resolution, then you have your denouement. You, you don't have that, mm-hmm. which, is, um, which is probably Eastern as well. Do you know, it's probably a different way of looking at the world um, and very tied in with, with their belief system around the gods and, and your position as a mortal to the gods. Yeah, there's a kind of, I suppose, provisional or contingent feeling to it, maybe. If mm. I don't know if that's the right way to put it, but it certainly doesn't have that completion to that mm. extent. So the quest, I guess, I mean, there is a quest, as it's referred to, at least in the translations, but it's not as if, oh, quest over, job done. <laughs> yeah. you know, but it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't provide us with that, which is really quite fascinating. Yeah. Would anybody like to ask a question? Or, oh, terrific. Sure. I have four questions. Oh, my goodness. First two are very easy. Uh, where can we see the film? Um, very good question. Uh, I, uh, Iraq. I, uh, <laughs> Iraq. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I, we'll, we'll have a list of... of um, I'll put a link up online on our website. That's exactly what I'll do. You can see it on our website. Okay. And where... Or, uh, do we need to know the story or something of the story before we see it to understand or to... I hope not. I hope that it's an interesting piece of work that whether you know the entirety or the intensity of the story, I hope that the, the themes and the mood right. will speak strong enough. Well, thank you. Now, the, the other questions are a little more involved. Because uh, I heard mathematics mentioned this a few times. And I'm just, I can't remember what, you know, how we understand the world is, depends a lot on how we how we count. We, we use, of course, base 10, which is relatively new, and now we're in base 2. But what base system were they using mm. in that 60. time? 60. 60. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. What? 60. Yeah. It was 60. It was base 60. That's uh, 60. I, I understand it's 60, and there's a lot of 10s in there as well. Yeah. Now, I only know this from the outside. But of course, there's a good reason to do that, and it's the reason we still divide an hour. Yeah into 60 minutes. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a very flexible system for division, especially. Yeah. Right. Excellent. <laughs> you, have one, you. you have one further question? Uh, I, I have one further. <laughs> Far away. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> it's about diffusion all around the Middle East because there are elements of the story that arrive, that, that show up in the biblical stories and in Egypt as well. How much diffusion and how much, and in the Ili- Iliad and Odyssey as well, how much diffusion, uh, uh, how do we see these stories moving around and, and showing up in different, uh, um, I guess, in variations of a theme, so to speak, throughout the Middle East, uh-huh. from Egypt uh-huh. to yeah. Samaria? Um, it's visible that that, that that happened. And there are passages in Homer's Iliad that are almost like word-for-word translations or passages from Gilgamesh, the odd time. And, and the, the, in, 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 in the Hebrew Bible, for the, in the way that I mentioned, the, uh, the transfer is, is, is obvious. Uh, the ancient Near East come Mediterranean world, that whole great swathe of the world, 
must have been a place for what I'll call the low level diffusion of culture. It was normal in antiquity to be bilingual or tri trilingual. People who traded, women who got moved back and forth uh, in the fall of cities and as slaves must have been a tremendously powerful force for, for, mm. for, for, for moving stories around. Yet it's invisible now because it's somebody else, it's the officials who write the written texts that survive. So f various people have you know, speculated about uh, someone who knows Babylonian as a scribe learning, say, ancient Greek, learning to write ancient Greek. That could have happened in the 700s BC, for example. But we know of no one directly who was culturally bilingual in that way mm -hmm. Because the cultural bilinguals aren't the ones that get remembered in the written record. So it's like you've got this <coughs> almost underground movement uh, that must have been so strong mm -hmm. in, in, in the ancient Near Eastern world and, and, and we can't touch it directly, we can only see its effects. Yeah. A question behind, yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. In the orange. <coughs> so where does myth come from? Ooh, that's a good question. Where, do you just, where does just myth come landed from? Landed a whopper there. <laughs> yeah. Where cool. does myth come from? Who wants to take that? Marina, you, you, you've engaged with myth well, in different ways. Oh I'm God. putting you on the spot here. But, um, I wouldn't dare answer that. Um, where does it come from? Well, I, I think it probably comes from the cave. Yeah. You know, I think uh, a symbolic order. Um, when we first looked up and started naming things and telling stories about things and started to wonder. Um, but the short answer is, I don't know. <laughs> and sometimes you could say, maybe we come with the myths, you know? Yeah. We're clay and, and stardust, you know, we're made up of both. Um, I don't know. It is, but it's that powerful desire to <clears throat> tell stories about where you come from yeah. and of key episodes in human life. That's it, an organizing principle. Yeah, yeah. and I, I think it's, all, it's a way of understanding ourselves um, mm. and recording ourselves mm. in a way. I think sometimes I think myth mm. is more truth than reality, mm. <laughs> like in the context of mm. where, where the where the stories we get, where the characters we get, where the sense of understanding or curiosity, or to use you know, a really generic term, the processing of things. Mm. I, yeah. I go to myth a lot, mm. you know, because it houses certain things that are almost um, too big to understand. Mm. Uh, and it's, it's the bigger, it, it's a, and yet it's the personal as well, I don't know. Mm. I, yeah. You know, so I would say I don't know where it comes from, but I understand what it does mm -hmm. and how it helps us. That okay, so how did Gilgamesh um, was the king of Ish, um, Uruk back in the day? How, how did he become the king? Yeah. Well, I'm going to defer to the <laughs> academic of brilliance here at the table to my left. Yeah. <laughs> well, as, as, as far as I remember... Questions. Yeah, his father was the king. Uh, so it went from father to son. Uh, yeah. And the poem doesn't, the actual poem doesn't tell us that because it's interested in the problems that he has. Mm. And I guess it's easy to think of kings and kingship as something to admire, you know, that, that literature would be glorifying kings. Just like David in the Hebrew Bible, literature is much more concerned with the mistakes that they make <laughs> uh, and the problems that they cause. And I think that's always been the case. And what age, what, what age is Gilgamesh at the start of the poem? Do we, do we know? Roughly? Did you, you had a number. Yeah. We, we, we have him uh, dying at 18. We had him dying <laughs> at 18, yeah. yeah. Well, he's know, old in the poem at the end. Said, well, yeah. he's wise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's seen the deeps, but they don't give an age. No. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Uh, he, he passes down the tradition in the funniest ways, and even in the Dead Sea Scrolls, one of the esoteric Hebrew scriptures there, he, he, he turns up in the Book of Giants as a Gilgamesh, character. Yeah. You know? And uh, there's a late Mesopotamian poem where himself and Humbaba kind of appear 
almost as if they're pals because they've been taken like not pals but they've been taken from a list they've been in a list you know of of great giant heroes of the past yeah and and, and new stories made out of them but even like the fact that there's a book of giants i know i mean are you joking well Mm. it's like yeah, they say that he ruled for 126 years. Yeah. That's yeah. one of the sources. Yeah. Yeah. That, that would be in the Sumerian king list. That's probably where that's the where that, comes yeah. from. Yeah. I get confused. There's so many lists yeah. and yeah. 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 versions. Yeah. And but the, 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 yeah. as I understand it, that king list was, it was important as a kind of structuring device. Yeah. And the names would get passed down mm. and new stories invented. Oh, okay. yeah. Right. Uh, to almost to fill the gaps mm. out of them. Oh. The other question, yeah, at the front, yeah. yeah I'd just like to um, like, seem to have had a few coincidences happening over the last couple of weeks. Happened to be, <coughs> happened to be listening to a podcast like last week where they went into the Babylonian uh, mathematics thing, which is all based on uh, joints and hands and things. Um, uh, which is, I think, like there, there's three per finger times four fingers and two thumbs leaves you at 60. Other thing was today, this afternoon, there was a pot, there was a webinar on a new book on prostitution where the story of George Smith translating the uh, Gilgamesh thing and refusing to touch the thing on Ikadu and John Blanco, like uh, the... the um, Process. Uh, I think he like just went. Eek, it goes against my sensibilities, and just mm. yeah. shoved it away from him. Um, got translated somehow. So, uh, but yeah, this was wow. this was interesting. Oh, and um, struck me as well. I uh, heard something else about uh, the Magdalene. Well, somebody did a podcast recently on the Magdalene, the whole system where by in the initial stages of the Christian church, women had much more powerful roles than later, which were heavily suppressed afterwards. So, um, whereas they had been uh, church leaders, they, uh, by, what's it, like 10th century or whatever, like, uh, they're, they're shoved out of that. Hmm. I was wondering also, like, um, you don't know how many versions of um, of Gilgamesh you, there have been, do you? Like, uh, that, that, it's presumably changed quite a bit over time. Well, in in, in ancient times, it, it kept changing. Right, yeah. that's you what know? I was thinking. Uh, yeah. So there would be, I think they divided into uh, three main, they say recensions, three main versions. Okay. But God knows how long it kept being changed, kept being developed, and how many creative minds went into that. Yeah, uh, just question. one last uh, point. Um, heard a thing about the history of Egypt last week as well, like where somebody was pointing out that the Egypt was a power for so long that Cleopatra is closer to us chronologically now <laughs> than she is to the Old Kingdom. <laughs> um, and I was just wondering how far back Gilgamesh actually went. Well, I mean, you'd know that more than I yeah, would know. What, what, <coughs> what's the notion? I, I, I thinking, think yeah. the, the notional kind of date for the, the earliest datable tablets, the one that are datable text, the ones in Sumerian, would take you back to 2000 BC anyway, maybe earlier. Uh, but even there it becomes very doubtful because Sumerian was always a learned language. Mm. You know, there's, there's no record of it as a spoken language language it's like it was in the kind of closed world of the scribal schools Mm. so they were writing texts in that language even though they were speaking other and younger languages but the continuity over time is it it dwarfs anything that we can point to in european culture afterwards Mm -hmm. okay it's fascinating idea of uh yeah cleopatra our contemporary and (laughs) it's the way human time is distributed Uh, maybe last question if anybody else wanted to, to come in there you have one more here I do, yes. Okay, if, good stuff. We'll take one more, though. So, yeah. Can you, can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> Having done this project, when you, um, when you look at the world now or you look around you, how much do you see Gilgamesh <laughs> now that you've read about it? How much of it do you see around you today? Do you? I do. Mm-hmm. 
I do. I, I think that that's something that really resonated for both of us mm -hmm. in the work. Um, I was really, again, I, I think I was, and I know it's down to a creative interpretation mm. of, of the story, so I, I own that as well, you know. But I just thought that there was, it was really interesting. Um, the, the, I suppose the thing that really spoke to me was around that hero's journey <clears throat> and power and um, the choices that are made. A certain kind of leadership was formed and kind of carved mm. into shape mm. um, with certain practices and certain, certain mores that I feel are, are, still, are still happening today, you know? And um, I found that absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. I was going, ah, oh, you know, because I was thinking about, um, and again, this is just my own personal taking up, but I was thinking, oh, that's really interesting when you look at like, this, the, um, the hero has, you know, the Joseph Campbell mm -hmm. kind of journeying of this hero. And I thought, wow, it's really interesting because we're really setting ourselves up for a great fall there from the very beginning mm -hmm. around the strides that we're all mm -hmm. going to be uh, leaders that will pursue soul and truth and connection and mm -hmm. benevolence over uh, ego, power, greed and um, destruction. destruction. <laughs> and I think what's interesting and what I found artistically interesting about Gilgamesh is he presented to me uh, and reveal to me certain life choices and certain philosophical sensibilities that I think are far more mirrored, are absolutely mirrored in um, the leadership and in politics mm. and in practice and in institutions and what we have today. So I loved that correlation. Mm. I thought, oh, this didn't happen yesterday. Like, mm -hmm. this was founded a long time ago and these are the principles and practices that we have decided are, are the ones that we should work out of. But you could say, though, that the story itself is still very much a living story. It is a living it's story. story. It's, and that's where I think it's bringing that Michael and Marina were talking about the fact that it's not finished. And when Andrew George says it'll take <laughs> centuries for <laughs> us to find it, I'm really curious as to go, wh what kind of leader or what kind of person does Gilgamesh mm. end up being or emerging as? Mm. And what are the role of the gods? What are the role of the people? And what is the role of this, mm. this man at the end of that journey? We don't know that. Mm. So I think that's very interesting as well. Mm. Are you finding that too, Marina, that you're recognizing Gilgameshes as you, <laughs> you go about your, <laughs> well, your daily life? I, I suppose when the, the poetry is so strong, you can, you can read your own life into it oh, yeah. you? and the life of your times because the images are so startling in one way and so generic in another way and it is the it is the quest and I suppose we all like to think we 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 live uh, not just on the literal plane but that we are you know thinking and dreaming a bit as well so you can find you can find the correlations you need um, you can find yeah. the deterrence, you can read it as a cautionary tale, you can read it as a, an anti-hero story, you can read it as a hero's know, journey, hero's yeah. journey. Mm. you can read it as the death of the gods, you can read it as a, as a tract on, on mortality and its griefs. I mean, there's just so many ways mm. you can... That's why it's it. fascinating and yeah. relevant, I think. It's probably a good... good oh, well, we have a, I think Someone we have a question there. there. I see someone's hand. Yeah, please. Do you know who wrote the first tale of Gilgamesh? Oh, <laughs> we look to uh, Michael. <laughs> no, they, 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 no, none, I think none of the very early texts that survive have authors' names on them. Uh, some of the later ones do, and they, the guy who wrote the big version, the monumental version, we call it, which is the one that everyone here has, has, has used, uh, he's called Sin Lequiunini. Uh, it's awful. the name it took yeah. me a while to learn it by heart but I did it oh, that uh, is the first time I've heard it pronounced yeah. Yeah. I never heard how to pronounce it here, but I uh, how to pronounce it the, the, the thing is that, that the funny thing is that a lot of, a lot of ancient Mesopotamian texts do have authors names uh, including many that are women's names interestingly which you don't get in Greek literature mm. you know mm. a Powerful thousand years Sappho. later yeah. uh, mm. and it's strange that there, 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 there was a uh, a, a, a using of authors' names in both genders. 
But for this one, where it all started, like all of the, 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 the fundamental basic myths from ancient times, no one knows what's the name of the person who first put this story together. Mm. Huh. Wow. That's a suitably you know, open-ended way to, yeah. to conclude our discussion. So I wanted to thank everyone for being here this evening. I just would make a few closing words of thanks. Our, our event tonight, we hope, is going to be one of several and on the theme of ancient classics in modern Galway. So that's something to look forward to, a series, I hope, that Michael and his colleagues and Sarah will, will uh, provide to the, the city and community of Galway. Um, the event, as I said, was funded by the Moore Institute, by NUI Galway, i um, delighted to have that support in connection with Galway 2020. Um, as well as the participants tonight, we wanted to thank uh, Martha Shocknessy in the Moore Institute, uh, David Kelly, who's actually here, Matthew Garrity, uh, but also to Brendan McGowan, Damian Dolan, and the staff of the Galway City Museum. Um, and Jonathan Con Connolly of Bright Blue Productions, thank you very much uh, for all of their support in producing the event and also to the School of Languages, Literatures, and Cultures at NUI Galway, where Classics is, is based. Um, I want to thank very warmly uh, Marina, Michael, and Nolene for their contributions tonight. It's really been a fascinating discussion. We have so much to look forward to, not just in the full-length film, when we get a chance to, to see it when it becomes uh, available, but also to, to, to the play. Really very exciting. So yeah. thank you all very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.